Morrowind is a masterclass of RPG design and while there have been grand open worlds before and definitely since, none of them have truly captured the sense of adventure and made the player care about the world in the same way that Morrowind has. There is an undeniable allure to that game and while I have found very few games like it, I'm always on the lookout for the next one that can scratch that same itch. So when Stefan linked Dread Delusion and asked, is this Morrowind? I knew I had to check it out. Dread Delusion is a game set in a world that broke some time ago. You start the game like a certain other game, as a nameless prisoner and make your character. Naturally, we've been allowed an early release if we, in exchange for that, hunt down an evil sorceress. We of course agree, because why wouldn't we, and then we set out to stop her. We rush to confront her at her ship nearby, but we are of course too late. She leaves us with a cryptic message that shows deceit in our minds as to if the intentions of the people we are working for are pure, and then she sails off in her flying ship, and then the game begins proper. From here on out, we can go anywhere, anytime, and do whatever we want. There is of course a main quest, but the world operates on Morrowind time, so we can do it whenever we want. Which is good, because the world is immediately incredibly interesting. Like I alluded to earlier, it takes place in a broken world. The world was once not a collection of floating islands that orbit a mystical force, but a planet like ours. Something happened, something cataclysmic and possibly man-made, and now it's not just a planet anymore. The people we are working for are the Union, and they are a colonizing empire that have brought most of the floating lands under one banner, and not always peacefully. That much is made clear from the very beginning of the game. It's an incredibly interesting world to explore, and the game takes full advantage of its floating island locale. There is a great sense of verticality to the landscape and the buildings, and much of the journey through the lands involves moving from one island to another, crossing strange road bridges, and even jumping across the great abyss to do so. There are towns suspended in the sky, airship anchored at floating docks high above, and whole mountain chains just floating by themselves. It's an incredibly visually engaging world to explore, just judging from how it's designed, but it is also an incredibly graphically stunning one with an asterisk. Dread Delusion is part of the Haunted PS1 movement, a series of loosely visually and thematically connected games that all look like how we remember obscure horror games looking like on the PS1. The graphics are very chunky and in a very endearing way, and feel like a cross between Minecraft and a PS1 first-person horror RPG. The textures are so low res that it borders on being pixel art, and I'm honestly here for it. Aesthetically, it also seems to borrow a lot from Echo Knight and the Deception games, and seems to attempt and emulate their very late 80s, early 90s, high-concept, high-budget anime look. And that combined with uh, what I mentioned earlier and the low poly models as well as the gorgeously thematically appropriate sound design as well as how the dialogue system works, creates this incredibly visually engaging experience that just bathed in style and nostalgia bait. But unfortunately they went a bit overboard with the nostalgia. It impacts both gameplay and graphics, and let's just get the graphics out of the way, because the way it impacts gameplay actually works for both better and worse. I don't know what they did to the visuals and why they thought it was a good idea, and at first I thought it was my computer having issues running it, but after I turned VSync on and off and played at a lower resolution, I can confirm that the game has built-in screen sharing for that authentic PS1 feel. And it's absolutely fucking awful, and that combined with the faux PS1 texture warble unfortunately creates a visual experience that, while pretty at a glance, feels terrible on your eyes themselves to experience. And the warble and the tearing will start to grate on you after a while, to the point that you might unfortunately need to take breaks, because it's such an unpleasant game to experience. Visually. I'm sure it can be fixed by adding options to turn off all the fuckery in the menu, and I hope it does, because I want to return to this world. I just don't want to get my eyeballs violated while I do so. When I went into this game, it was to experience a game like Morrowind, and I can unfortunately report that it has completely failed to deliver on that promise. Instead, basically being just Arx Vitalis through and through. And I'm fucking alright with that, because Arx Vitalis is a great game, and I've been saying for years that I would love if more developers made more RPGs like it. Small world maps, quality quests that are well designed, and few of them, and interesting gameplay that takes risk. And Dread Delusion is absolutely that fucking kind of game, and I fucking love it. At first I was not impressed at all, the screen sharing and wobble was bothering me, the hit detection and the wind-up animation of the weapons was annoying, and so was the slow-ass walk speed and the pitiful jump height. 
I felt like I chubby chocolate with asthma trying to navigate this world and I felt stupid as well because I couldn't figure out how to do anything. This is a common issue in immersive sims that are set in more open worlds. The risk of letting the player go into whatever direction they please from the get go is that you risk them walking into a dead end and then another dead end and then another and that is exactly what I did. Post a tutorial you are giving a mission of tracking down three people who might have information on the sorcerers in a nearby land, the Hallowshire. And that's great, it's not hard to know where to go because the Hallow the town in Hallowshire is one of the towns suspended up on a series of floating rocks and the first building to greet you is an inn on top of the hill with a giant skeleton face on it. The way the dialogue system works is that every NPC has like three things they can say and you're supposed to just ask each and every one in each town and then at some point bump into the right one with the right line of dialogue. This sounds annoying but in a game like this where towns have like 10 people it's not an issue. And it also serves the purpose of organically exposing the player to the side quest and you're supposed to get a sidetrack by these side quests and then go make your place in the world and become more comfortable with the game's mechanics and get some nice gear before moving on to actually doing the main quest. But if you are unlucky, you will, like me, due to how the skill system is designed, run into one brick wall after another, not being able to solve any of the quests you pick up, and it's a bit disheartening. And I feel like there has to be a way to get the player on track to solving the quest that they are equipped to solve. See, the very cool thing about the game is that it only has four major skills. Might, Guile, Wisdom and Persona. Might, as you might expect, increases your combat abilities and is very straightforward. If you can't beat a monster to complete a quest, you need a higher level of Might. Easy. But that easy train of thought does not extend to the other skills. Guile governs stamina, jump, run speed and lockpicking, and while the physical abilities are straightforward, lockpicking, eh, not so much. Wisdom governs mana, of course, as well as law and spellcast skills, with law being the obtuse one. And finally, there is Persona. It increases regen, gives you better prices, and it increases charm, and charm is a bit odd. The game doesn't really show you how many of these skills are used and relies on throwaway NPC dialogue to communicate it, which is fairly easy missable, especially since all skills are tutorialized in the beginning of the game. But the actual tutorials don't mention all of the vital information you need to know about the skills, only how they basically work. The only quest in the beginning that really does show you how a skill works is the first one. It's the first one you can crawl across in Hello. If you talk to an NPC on the docks, what you can learn from a guard is the slum of the city. He will ask you to smuggle a shipment to the inn past the bridge. At the bridge you will then be asked by a guard what you are carrying and if you have points in Persona you will be able to use a speech check. The thing about the speech check is that it trolls you and it, you won't be allowed to pass. And that's the game way of communicating that the skills you have don't just give you access to a menu of checks that you can use to bypass obstacles, they have to actually be used. And the way to actually get past the guard is to just say something normal like you were just making a delivery of some iron and then he will let you pass because you are carrying iron and it makes sense that you are making a delivery of iron. The quest we then get from that is to seek out the city's thieves guild and we do. And here we get a mission to go into a secret room in a shop and if we creep around the sewers we can find a locked door that seems to be under the house where the secret room is. But to get inside we need to pick a lock. The way that lock picking works is that you use a lock and then a dice is rolled. The lock will require a certain amount of eyes to let you pick it, but the game aside from a piece of throwaway dialogue never explains that your chances of making a higher roll will increase with of course your lock picking skill, but also increase if you're well rested. If you don't know this, and you probably won't because it's only explained by a random drunk at a tavern using in will dialogue, you will be stuck at that quest probably. Which isn't a problem in other RPGs because you can just go do another quest, but in this game we are required to use the skills you have to do a quest. And here in the beginning you only have very few quests, so if you can't figure out how to use the skills you already have to solve the quest right ahead of you, you can't progress, get more points to put into other skills, opening up other quests for you. It seems like such an easy fix, just have the first hour of quest make the quest giver give you like little comments on whether or not the player wields the necessary skills to overcome the obstacles in the quest, like, oh hey, you look like a guy who can pick a lock, do I have a job for you? And if you don't have the skills, the dialogue will then change to, 
Hey kid, I'm not sure you'll be able to handle this. You don't look like someone who's particularly handy around a locked door or something to that effect. Allow the player to take on the quest, but give them some sort of idea if they can handle it or not. This is a problem that every immersive sim struggles with, including Art Vitalis. It's not a problem that persists throughout the entire experience, it's only here in the beginning hours. And it's so common that I've come to nickname it the Brick Wall Salsa, because you're doing one step forward, one step backwards, in between two brick walls. Until you find your way through, and I eventually did, and when I did, it was good, and it only got better from there. I found a man in the tower who mentioned that if only he could afford a telescope from a local shop, he could see the faraway landscape up close. Curious by this and thinking there might have been a reward for giving him one, I went to the shop, bought one, and tried to give it to him, but I couldn't. And then I realized that his dialogue was just a trick to get me to go into the shop, so with that I would discover that there were items in there that could be used to solve other quests. See, right in the beginning a dude asked me to go to the mountains to the east to find a diary he lost, but there is no compass in the world so I had no idea where east was, and there are mountains everywhere. And when I got a quest to get into the secret room, I poked around the store where it was located and talked to the guy I was there to rob and he mentioned that his airship was last spotted to the south, and that he would pay handsomely to have the cargo returned since he feared that something had happened to the crew. And again, I had no idea where south was, because this world doesn't have a sun, it just has like a bl bl blowing orb that all the islands revolve around. But the shop where I bought the telescope did have a compass, which I realized when I didn't know what to do, so I went back and bought it. And then I started heading south, and. I was getting tired of the game by this point, and words like pretentious and masturbatory were included in phrases I was using to describe the game in my head. But then, as I embarked on the quest southbound, I stopped here and there at points in the landscape where things looked like they held secret. Because I had at this point realized that while the game wasn't a Morrowind game, it was very much a game where there around every corner was an adventure. And every corner I looked around always had something. A coin here, a potion there, and maybe even some actual treasure sometimes. But then I saw it. Flying high above me in the skies, circling a floating rock, was a ship. And surely, the ship. I snuck past some beings in a secret temple and made my way up to the rock the ship was circling and at the top I couldn't figure out how to get in, but then I realized that the ship was making an uneven circle around the rock, and if I positioned myself right, I could wait for it to come close enough during its lap, and I did, and I, I made the jump, and I was completely floored. For one, I had finally figured out how to solve any quest in the game, and the quest I had solved had me scale up a mountain of epic proportions and jump onto a flying ship that was sort of like derelict in the sky. And I don't know if I can probably put it into words, but I was awestruck by the epicness and the scope of this mini-adventure. Inside I found the crew and they were acting strange, demanding that I fetch them grub from the hull. I complied, but in the hall there was no grok, and instead just a weird statue, which I picked up, and then I returned to where I had encountered the crew, and the men were... not there anymore. Well, they were, but they were now corpses. And they weren't just corpses, they were very old corpses. I returned the statue to the trader I was originally going to rob, and he then asked me to go return to him in a day to get my reward, to which I complied, but when I returned he had met a similar fate as the crew on the ship. The statue is apparently cursed and sucks the soul out of the men who try and possess it. And by this point I was completely sold on the game, like, whoo! Oh yeah, baby! You might also by this point notice that my character is moving quite a bit faster, and that is because skills in this game do truly matter, and 4 points in Guile is the difference between Asthma Toddler and Sonic the Hedgehog. And it's when you start getting these skills and putting them into attributes that the game really starts to get fun, exactly like Arx Vitalis. And I think that was a pretty extensive overview of what the game Dread Delusion has to offer. Visual gripes aside, it's a fantastic game that perfectly emulates what it is that makes Arx Vitalis a special game that has become a cult classic RPG among RPG hardcores. 
It perfectly replicates all of that with its similar philosophy of making every corner you turn special and make everyone in the world important in some way and make everything you do feel important and make everything you do give you something in return. I haven't even gone through everything. There is a robust spell system that I didn't get to spend quite as much time with as I would have, as well as a nice crafting system. Your weapons and armor can all be upgraded if you have the right resources and while some resources will make your sword hit harder, Others will give it new abilities like this twin blade here. And there is of course also a solid alchemy system and its potions works like the skill system itself. It really makes a difference with some potions giving you superhuman abilities. Even if you're not gonna use potions much, it's still worth putting points in because in true Elder Scrolls fashion, the system can be gamed and you can completely ruin the economy with it and become the wealthiest person in this broken world. I hope you enjoyed this look at Dread Delusion and I hope it can help you make the decision on whether or not to buy it. My recommendation is a yes with an asterisk. I fully recommend this game, but I would very much like it if it gave me the option to turn off all the visual stuff and if it does, I will dive back into it and probably give it a full analysis. But that is neither here nor there. Until I see you again, take care and until then, bye bye.